Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, super kind introduction. I hope the presentation will meet up with this uh, uh, introduction. So um, the title of my talks in a short form is From Quarks to, Drug, to Drugs. And in, sort of, in some sense, I want to tell you about the scientific journey that uh, Esperanza has just sort of mentioned, uh, telling you how, you know, in 15 years of research, uh, my collaborators and I could go from, say, hadron structure, topological structure of the QCD vacuum and gauge fields and quarks and gluons to apply those methods and, and things we have learned and co-developed in that context, all the way to discovering new drugs uh, or potential drugs to be more um, uh, with a more, uh, to be more precise, with a very, very late twist into space physics, which is something nobody here has heard of, even the organizers, I guess, and it's something I'm very excited to report about in the very last slide. So this is a journey that can, will contain several steps. And first of all, interrupt me anytime through the chat or even directly. And I'd like to make this a really uh, two-sided sort of a, uh, conversation in the sense that it's admittedly outside of the main focus of this school. So I don't expect anybody to be proficient with some of the concepts that I will sort of mention. However, I think I will try to phrase all this conversation from the eyes of a nuclear physicist so that somehow I would expect at least the perspective to be sort of transparent for most of you, especially the young students with a, an open perspective to theoretical physics. Um, and in, Perhaps in this sense, I will be helped by the fact that I still consider myself a nuclear physicist in all respects, except that I don't work on nuclear physics, but the way I think and I approach to whatever complex system I'm looking at is through the eye of a nuclear physicist, meaning looking at separations of scale, renormalization group ideas and all of that. But this will become clear through the talk. So in this journey, I will draw a line connecting quarks to say the pharmaceutical bench. And as I will walk through this landscape, we will progressively shift from being more fundamental to more applied as we go to say from left to right and from say physics based uh, science to biology more based science or even pharmacology. And we go from top to bottom of this journey and we'll see how it goes. Uh, so before we start, let me say a couple of words about the main actors, the main, you know, physical systems we'll be caring about in this talk. And these are proteins. Uh, proteins are the nanomachine of uh, life. Basically, they are uh, the macromolecules that have been designed by evolution to carry out all of the, basically all of the functions that uh, happen in living organism from, I don't know, transport of uh, oxygens to helping uh, the mm, duplication and, and, and copying of uh, genetic information to uh, forming uh, all sorts of biological functions that goes on in the cell. They're basically evolutionally designed uh, nanomachines. And uh, but from a physicist complex, uh, perspective, they are basically very complex, many body systems subject to fluctuations and dissipations. So in some sense, they're not very far from Newton's stars just discussed in the previous lecture. We'll see in a moment in which sense. The first, there are already differences. Of course, the, the main difference comes from the fact that uh, at, the, at least on the first look, proteins uh, behave like classical objects. Why, you know? most systems I guess you're familiar with are intrinsically quantum. So it's instructive to start off from this slide. This slide is, you know, the standard uh, length over time scales plot and sort of uh, uh, it's a map of where different systems stand on this map. For instance, in the upper right corner, we have uh, so objects that live like for seconds and dynamics, characteristic dynamic scales of seconds and length scales of meters, that's us. And as you go to smaller and smaller systems and shorter and shorter time scales, uh, you see a number of uh, you know different systems, uh, and I'm focusing here on the uh, living systems. But most of these systems and most of you know are entirely classical. They live in the, what I you know 
call the classical realm of physics until you hit a kind of a borderline, which is a fuzzy borderline in a sense that I will discuss, uh, where you start seeing the appearance of quantum effects. We all know that, right? And eventually on the opposite corner, lower bottom, we have atomic physics, uh, which is entirely quantum, right? And from that point on, everything goes quantum. So what is in the borderline? What does uh, what, what is sitting in the borderline? Well, macromolecules and particular proteins and nucleic acids like DNA and RNA sit right at the borderline between the classical realm and the quantum realm. And to be a little bit more precise, they're like two-footed animals with one foot in the quantum realm and one foot in the classical realm. And to be even more precise, the electronic structure the electronic structure of macromolecules is, of course, entirely quantum. But if you integrate out the electrons and you look at the effective force produced by, you know, on the atomic nuclei by the fact that there is an electronic cloud, you get an effective force, an effective potential. And if you are able to parameterize that effective potential, then you get a dynamics for the atomic nuclei, which is essentially a classical dynamics. So in some sense, we're in a similar situation of the you know, many body potentials of nuclear physics, where you have underlying degrees of freedom responsible for the V18 potential. But the difference here is that once you have the V18 potential, rather than having to solve for the, atom, for, for the nuclear wave function, in this case, it's sufficient to perform Newton's, uh, uh, to solve Newton's equations of motion to understand the further motion of the atomic nuclei. So I always found extremely fascinating the fact that nature was able to build its nano machine at the last available classical scale. It's the last scale where you can actually think in terms of I move an object from here to here, I rotate something, I stretch something, I open a gate. Because you know, when you pass the scale, you go to an entirely quantum scale. These concepts really don't make sense anymore. And in some sense, nature was built on machines that operate at the last class uh, scale available before going quantum. So this idea of uh, a multi-scale approach in which you try to use quantum mechanics to get uh, your effective interaction between nuclei and then solve for Newton's uh, equations for the nuclei is a multi-scale approach that was uh, granted a Nobel Prize for chemistry in 2013. It should be mentioned that pretty much like in nuclear theory, uh, quantum you don't really uh, compute the atomic forces between the atomic nuclei in a macromolecule entirely from quantum mechanics. That would be the analog of using lattice field theory to get the nuclear physics potential, I would say, right? You don't do quite that. What you do is that typically use quantum mechanics to get a roughly first uh, inspirational starting point for your uh, parameters, and then you refine the parameters and tweak them to meet the data and the experimental data. And the reason is that quantum mechanical calculations are, are very complex and very often error prone. And, and also there's a number of assumptions you have to make in order to make them work. And in the end, it's actually uh, important that you meet the experiment because here comes a very, very fundamental difference between nuclear physics, and I would say physics in general, and biology. You see, when you work with physics, a first semi-quantitative guess and understanding is good enough. Say, you work in hadronic physics, you suppose you have a nice quark model and you predict the mass of the hadrons within say 20% accuracy. That's a good, good result, right? I mean, uh, Think about the accuracy of, you know, Gelman uh, prediction for the omega minus. That's a familiar example. That was certainly not much better than that, right? And it was worth a Nobel Prize. In nuclear physics, you probably want to go to a couple of percent before you claim you have enough accuracy. I mean, talking low energy nuclear physics. But if your temperature in your body changes by 10% in Kelvin, you die the biology of your body changes completely. So biology is a precision science. In order to do biophysics and molecular biology from the reductionist's approach, bottom up, you really need 
to be accurate. And that's why you really need to meet the data at each step to make sure that what you get is the possible, is the best accuracy uh, possible to your scheme. And that's also why it's not quite granted from the beginning that there's room for physics in this field, because, hey, this is a hell of a problem. You need dynamics, you need accurate accuracy, you need solving many body problems with phase transitions and all that. So it's a challenging field for physicists. And let me be a little bit more specific. Uh, suppose you want to study a fundamental biology, biological problem using a physics-based approach. And again, physics-based approach means that rather than trying to study biology, say, top to bottom, looking at connections and networks between different biological agents without trying to understand the physics behind each molecular step, you're working the other way around. You try to formulate a Hamiltonian that incorporates all of your fundamental understanding of condensed matter theory, and you try to use this information to build up a microscopic understanding of specific um, instances that occur in a complex biological and living organism. For instance, you might be interested in a transition that a protein, this is a movie showing a protein change in shape, this is a pathological transition, by the way, that leads to uh, death by near degeneration, but let's not go into the biology of that. Suppose you want to understand that through a bottom-up approach. Well, you need to solve the Newton's equations for all the atoms involved in these systems. And this corresponds to solving, say, 10 to the 6 couple Newton's type equation. But this is not the main problem. The main problem is that you have to solve them integrating forward in time for a huge number of time steps. And this is the real main challenge in computational biophysics. So let me go a little bit more further in there. So why, why the main challenge comes from the fact that you need to solve the Newton's equation for very, very long times? Well, it is quite evident in this plot. What you have here is a typical uh, qualitative drawing of the free energy landscape, let's say energy landscape for sake of simplicity, involved in any transformations that biomolecules take uh, to perform their, uh, their function. So most biological processes occur because something happens. For example, a molecule, a molecule could change its, its shape, like I showed you in the previous movie, or a chemical reaction may occur. But nature always works in a way that it puts a barrier between two states, say the molecule in shape A and the molecule in shape B. And this is done because once you put the barrier in between, the rate of transitions cannot occur by simple diffusion. It has to occur through very rare fluctuations. Basically, you are in an open environment. There is temperature around. Your system gets kicks. And if it gets kicks, for very a consecutive large number of kicks, all in the right direction, you happen to be kicked by climbing a mountain until your last kick gets you on top of the mountain, and then you have 50% probability to roll off on the right or on the left. And this, as you can imagine, is equivalent to tossing a coin for millions of times, getting always heads before something happens. So this idea of using barrier to slow down the rate of transition exponentially is very instrumental because whenever nature needs something not to occur, it simply doubles the barrier, which leads to an exponential suppression of the rate of occurrence of the process. And when nat whenever nature needs something to occur, it lowers the barrier, which exponentially increases the rate of events uh, uh, that are involved in crossing the barrier. So it's a very powerful knob that nature can use to switch on and switch off processes. Now, the emergence of these barriers, uh, which makes the interesting processes extremely rare, is exemplified in the right corner you see here. Can you guys see my cursor as I shift it around? Can I use it as a pointer? Do you see this? Yes, yes. yes. We can see. So, so please look at this. This is, a, say, an order parameter for a transition through which a protein goes from an initial coil state. You know, proteins are basically polymers made of 20 types of amino acids. And they are created 
uh, by the ribosome, basic who reads the which reads the genetic information of the messenger RNA and translate that information into a sequence of amino acids. And then once these polymers are created, they contain within the sequence of amino acids the information to self-build themselves into a stable machine, which has a definitive shape called the protein native state. And in order to do that, they have to overcome one or more energy barriers. As a result of which, if you have an order parameter that distinguishes, say, the coil state from the native state, for instance, the length, the endpoint distance, or the shape, whatnot, well, if you look at the time series, how this evolves in times, it's something like in this plot. You have an exponentially long time in the in the in the open state, you know, being subject to fluctuations. And all of a sudden, you get a right kick into very sequence of rapid uh, uh, positive events until you reach the native state where you spend again an exponentially long time until you get the right fluctuation that takes you back to the other states and so on and so forth. So it turns out, as I will see later, that this time is exponentially long in a barrier. And, and therefore, um, this is uh, providing, this is the reason why if you perform, say, molecular dynamic simulations, which is basically integrating forward in time, starting from an initial condition, your Newton's equation, and you run on your, say, your Chineca cluster, which is the most powerful machine we have in Italy, for as long as your grant allows you to, uh, basically you end up only uh, monitoring in, in, uninteresting fluctuation in either the states. But what you would like to study is what happens during the transition, because that's where the interest in physics goes on. But you know, you have to be either extremely lucky to see one very rare event within your window of operation, or uh, you must have uh, basically unexisting resources in order to wait long enough until you see something in your operation time and have a statistically relevant sample of events to analyze. As a result of this decoupling of scales, uh, there is basically a minor overlap between the time that can be accessed by transitional molecular dynamic simulations and biologically interesting processes. In this case, in this talk, I will focus on this transformation of protein from the initial coil state to the final state, which is called the protein folding reaction. Protein folding reaction can take from milliseconds to minutes, depending on the system and the complexity of the protein. And molecular dynamic simulations barely scratch the milliseconds time scale. And to be more precise, in 2010, a big breakthrough was announced. A privately owned um, research institution called the DE Show Research was able to design a supercomputer and realize a supercomputer where all the molecular dynamics algorithms are not coded as in standard supercomputer, but they are implemented hardware like in a chip. So basically, uh, those who have my age have experience with the very, very early days of video gaming where computers were so little powerful that you could not really play video games and be happy on your computer. And you have to buy pieces of hardware that contain the code because hardware is much more uh, efficient in terms of, uh, um, of operational computational uh, uh, processing than having to you know, uh, write a code and then compile the code and then run it in a general purpose machine. And in particular, in this case, you get a speed up of a factor about 2000, as a result of which this machine could fold the smallest uh, polypeptide chains small pieces of proteins that have protein-like properties. So what you see here are the 12 hydrogen atoms of biophysics. These are the smallest possible sequences of amino acids that behave like mini proteins, but their folding times is in the microseconds to say barely milliseconds time scale. So really, and this supercomputer allows molecular simulation to cover all say up to a few milliseconds. So there was a window of overlap. And the result of this is that it was shown that the Hamiltonians and the molecular models that I was referring to before with this multi-scale approach were accurate enough to be able to predict with very good accuracy, 
the experimental structure of the native traits of this protein, showing that the model has enough accuracy to be able to recognize proteins from say random heteropolymers. And so pave the way to biology. However, in order to do biology, you need to bridge many orders of magnitude. And it's not gonna be the next generation of such uh, supercomputers to be in a condition to do that by plain molecular dynamics, because really biology, the biozone, so to say, is in the second time scales or tens of seconds or even minutes time scales. So uh, it was a fantastic success, but it was not the end of the game. And in fact, in the literature, there are, you know, a, a zoology of approaches that try to improve on the standard molecular dynamics and methods by introducing additional information. Typically, all these methods, except a few, capitalize of some extra information you might have from experiment. And if you're able to channel it into the calculation, then of course you can speed up the calculation. The problem that all of these methods are too computationally demanding for tackling many fundamental biological problems, including the folding of biologically relevant proteins that I was mentioned, and that we use as a paradigmatic problem in this lecture. And that's where the journey begins. So this was all a prologue to tell you that there were challenges up there and that say chemists approach may not be most efficient in tackling those challenges. And so here's where the, the journey that my group and my collaborators did. And I must say, I started the journey also in collaboration with Francisco Pederiva, you, you know from nuclear theory. So he played an important role in, in starting this journey with me uh, back in the 2006. Uh, and so I'm also grateful for this collaboration. I think it's a good moment to bring it up. Anyway, uh, so the first step is to identify that we have something to say. We have an angle that we can br bring in as nuclear physicists in order to say something that standard chemists may not be able to see. Of course, they have completely different and very powerful skills we don't have. Now, that's the beauty of interdisciplinarity. You work in a field where different people have different expertises. And although you cannot cover all the fields, you might hope to be able to bring something to the community. So I want to spend a couple of minutes telling you why there is a potential for an angle between nuclear theory and biophysics. And actually these considerations are those that intrigued me at the very beginning of this journey and led me to thinking that maybe we, I could work on biophysics. So uh, I was telling you before, the proteins are sequences of amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids. You can think about 20 different colors of little balls you can form a little chain with. And these chains are usually 100 to 200, 300 amino acids long. That's the typical size for eukaryotes uh, proteins. Now, there is an interesting thing. If you build, if you pick up a random sequence of amino acids, say of length 100, uh, you get a random or heteropolymer. Basically, you get a glassy energy landscape, and your system will never assume a particular conformation. It will keep on changing from one conformation to the other because the underlying energy landscape has a, an exponentially large number of nearly degenerate minima. So your system doesn't have a shape. Your entropy is, is very large and you, you don't build a machine with something that doesn't have a shape. If you want to build a cup of scissor, you need to have a shape for one blade and another blade and the possibility of cutting. However, nature throughout evolution was able to select a measure zero fraction of these random heteropolymer sequences such that the underlying energy landscape is not rugged, rugged and, and, and glassy, but instead has a very, very, very funneled energy landscape with a one stable minimum. As a result of which, once this chain exits the ribosomes, it will automatically roll, up, roll down this funnel here. Uh, my cursor has disappeared for some reason, but anyway, you see a funnel there. You will roll down the funnel and eventually being able to reach the native state. In some sense, you can reverse this logic and say out of the all possible combination, you can think about the amino acids as something like a 20 color object. And out of all possible combinations, there's only 
some few combinations that are allowed. And if you have one of those combinations, all of a sudden, the system has infinitely lower energy than a typical system. And so you have an exponential decoupling between specific color combinations of 20 amino acids and all the others. And this is already resembled of, of the idea of color confinement and only color signet being, being allowed and having a finite free energy at zero temperature in hadronic matter, right? In some sense, proteins are classical scalar confined systems, if you want to think about it that way. And in fact, if I look at the phase structure of hadronic matters and proteins, there are some uh, interesting analogies, right? Like we have an hadronic phase uh, where we live, where you have color confinement, but you will know that if you move along the temperature of chemical uh, potential axis, we deconfine the system, we go to a high entropy phase where all color non-singlet uh, states are potentially released. Similarly, if you have a protein in a native structure and you increase either urea, which is a denaturant, is a chemical uh, substance that leads to, uh, that tends to unfold the protein, or you heat it up, then you go to a phase where all possible conformational states and glassy behavior is relieved, and entropy is usually increased. And I guess these analogies simply reflect the fact that both proteins and hadrons are large complex many body systems made by, uh, dominated by fluctuations that are quantum in the case of hadrons and classical in the case of protons and strong correlations. So this was the angle to say, that maybe as nuclear physicists, we know how to deal with these problems. Maybe we have some tools that we can use and apply to biophysics to deal with the challenges that I was telling you about, simulating long and rare, uh, sorry, rare events of complex many body systems. And in that, the uh, bridge between these two worlds was provided by the realization that was already there in the literature that the Langevin dynamics in the open environment, and sorry, the Hamiltonian dynamics in the open environment can be under certain conditions translated into stochastic dynamics meaning that you can replace the effect of the environment by a random force and some viscosity. And then you can turn these dynamics and express it using path integral formalism. So basically what you see on the left, on, on the bottom corner here is uh, the, um, the conditional probability. Sorry, let's try to recover my cursor. No, I don't have a way to, to see my cursor anymore. Never mind. Okay. Uh, what you see on the bottom left is the conditional probability from, for a, say, polypeptide chain or a protein to be in one configuration Ri, where Ri is the collection of all the atomic coordinates, 3n coordinates, at time zero, to be found in configuration Rf at time t. And, you know, this looks, it sounds like a Feynman propagator. And just like a Feynman propagator, it can be written in a path integral form, as you can see here. I will not go into the details of this path integral. I just want to tell you, since you have stochastic fluctuations in your equations of motion, you can turn and you can describe this probability as a path integral. And there is an interesting analogy then you can build between phenomena we are familiar with in nuclear theory and phenomena that are important in biophysics. You see, biophysics is dominated by thermal activation, I was telling you before. Something that wouldn't happen if, not, if, if there weren't any thermal fluctuations around the macromolecule. Remember the kicks that the molecule needs to take in order to climb the barrier until the top, these are provided by the environment and they are basically a realization of the fact you have a thermal fluctuation in your systems. Without thermal activation, there would be no protein shade change. Similarly, we are familiar with the idea of quantum tunneling, which are fluctuation driven by quantum fluctuations, transitions driven by quantum fluctuations. And there is a theory that exploits the path integral formalism to describe quantum tunneling. This is the so-called Easton theory of quantum tunneling. And this theory plays an important role, or played at least an important role in the QCD from the 19, 90s to the first decade of 2000, I would say. I don't know if it's still quite popular as it used to be. I have been disconnected from the community for enough not to be able to make statements. 
But as a, as a graduate student, I was working on understanding the effect of quantum tunneling in the QCD vacuum onto the hadron structure uh, by uh, using the pathintegral formulation of quantum tunneling and the so-called instanton theory. So once I understood that, the, once I learned that uh, you know, thermal activation could be described as a pathintegral, immediately came the idea to say, well, maybe some of these uh, instanton-based methods developing subnuclear physics can be used to study and to solve computational problems associated with the rare events. And I, will, I want to immediately tell you why there is a hope for that. So remember what I said before, if you, if you look at the time scales, there's a, a decoupling of the time scale. You have to wait before the right fluctuation occurs. And then the process, once the right fluctuations occurs, which is extremely fast. Right. So to, to put this in context, typically the mean first passage time, the waiting time is in the seconds or tens of seconds time scale. But the transition path time, the short phase here, you see highlighted in blue, the time where a real a productive reaction takes place is in the microseconds time scales. And if you work out the statistical mechanics of it, you realize that the two time scales are related by a doubly logarithmic relationship. So this is why doing molecular dynamics is so exponentially complex. It's actually doubly exponentially complex because we want to study a short event, but in order to do that, you have to study a time window that is doubly exponentially long. So that's something that is quite hopeful. However, if you use the path integral formalism that I was referring to, in particular this, you can put the initial and final condition right into your Green's function you want to simulate. So you can provide this input and focus directly on the path that connect your initial configuration to the final configuration. In other words, you can provide initial and final configuration as input, but then the path integral will focus only on the reactive part of the dynamics, the blue area here, without spending any time in simulating everything that happens before a right successful event takes place. So really by doing this, you have a doubly exponential gain in computational time you need to simulate. You don't need to simulate in seconds or minutes, you can simulate microseconds. That's already one big advantage. Of course, there's no free lunch in physics, right? What is the price you have to pay for this lunch? you have to provide the initial and final configurations as inputs. You no longer predict them. However, there are experiments today based on uh, X-ray crystallography, basically uh, X-ray scattering and nuclear magnetic resonance experiments that can provide you with this information with an atomic resolution. So really you can get pictures of the native structure where you can place each atom with sub angstrom resolution. So you have this information available from experiment. That's exactly what I just said. However, even with this doubly exponential, uh, exponential gain, you're still too far off for being able to say, solve that path integral by using standard discretization and say a standard Monte Carlo, path integral Monte Carlo approach. Why is that? Because your system will consist in the least possible case, in case you treat all the solvent implicitly through an effective force field, uh, it will consist of a few thousands of degrees of freedom. But not only that, you have to discretize with femto femtoseconds delta t. Now that means that you have, uh, you know, 10 to the whatever, six or nine uh, time intervals in your path integral Monte Carlo, in each of which you have to sample 10 to the three, 10 to the four variables and you rapidly understand that this is completely unachievable with standard uh, path integral Monte Carlo methods. So even after taking doubly exponential advantage, you cannot solve the problem brute force in an exact way. You have to do additional approximations. And that's where all this idea of using instanton theory initially and other type of approaches came in. And that's where our research basically gave the largest contribution at the beginning. Here, you see a list of uh, physical review letters or 
uh, preceding National Academy of Science papers, uh, where we initially were started off using instanton theory and getting some insights from instanton theory, but later move into some more complex uh, approach that is somewhere in between some variational, uh, variational Monte Carlo and some hard tree approximation in some collective variable. I will not go into the details, but what I want to emphasize that they are, these are really theoretical physics methods. They are based on basically the same idea you would read in a nuclear physics paper. And, and this is a, just a snapshot of a few uh, pages of these papers. And this is not surprisingly that in the end you get something that looks very much like a standard nuclear physics calculations. I want to give you an example. Uh, how do we compute protein folding in what is called our most efficient approach today, most accurate approach to date, which is called the self-consistent subassembly. It is basically a self-consistent calculation a la Hartree-Fock. So basically what we do, uh, we have an initial guess like in Hartree-Fock, but it's not an literal guess of the wave function, but it's an initial guess of one collective variable which describes uh, the collective, the reaction coordinate. What is the reaction coordinate? It's basically a, a coordinate that tells you how the reaction goes. Uh, it moves you along your most probable path. Say, if you are going from Trento to Rome, and you're most probable, you're most likely going through the highway that goes through Bologna, Firenze, and then goes to Rome. And the mileage you've worked from Verona along the highway is a one dimensional coordinate that tells you how the reaction occurs. So that's, that's an example of reaction coordinate. So what you need at the beginning is the first guess of the reaction coordinate. And then we have a scheme to encourage the simulation to move forward along the reaction coordinate somehow so that you never go back on the reaction coordinate or actually you can go back, but you are encouraged to go forward. And the way we do that is not through by, by pushing the system is a more elaborated and gentle way of doing this, but let me not go into the detail. But if you encourage the system not to go back on the reaction coordinate, you very efficiently produce uh, reaction events. Because it's like, you know, the difference between having to solve a Kubrick cube by trial and errors. And, you know, anytime you make a right move, the move will stay. And then you all, you know, by itself. And so clearly this will generate the right solution in a matter of fractions of seconds, because anytime you get the right solution, you move forward, you never go back. So by doing this, you can immediately generate many folding pathways. However, our initial guess of the reaction cooling may be wrong. And you use this information to get a better estimate of the reaction coordinate. And then you bias along this reaction coordinate and you get a better estimate of your reaction coordinate and so on and so forth. And eventually you do this for all your initial configurations and you get a landscape telling you, you know, a network of transitions, how you go from each point to another, you reconstruct the entire kinetics. I should say, this looks like an algorithm, a heuristic algorithm. It is derived pretty much like any variational method in theoretical physics by say auxiliary field methods, uh, standard uh, Hubbard Stratonovich transformations and all of these arsenals of tools that come from nuclear theory. So uh, this will give you an idea of how interdisciplinary this is in this sense, what it means to be interdisciplinary in this context. So by doing this, we could simulate folding of proteins of any size occurring at any time scales, basically. So the first thing we ever did was to check that we get the same result that the plain MD simulations were giving for the 12 hydrogen atoms of protein folding. So the trajectories are publicly available. So we simulated the same systems with the same models. And even if I don't go into the detail, what this transparency, this slide shows you is that you know there are histograms and what the overlap between these two histograms basically is telling you that at the statistical level, the folding mechanism we predicted with this self-consistent path sampling method is statistically indistinguishable from the folding mechanism that is predicted by MD. So we are as accurate as MD. Of course, part of this accuracy is due to the fact that all of these processes are intrinsically stochastic because of thermal fluctuations. So stochasticity uh, kind of mixes the cards 
in a way that whatever is the remaining emerging pattern is, is indistinguishable from what we observe in our simulation. However, our simulations enable us to extend the window to the bio zone and simulate process that can take up to hours to occur. You see a couple of snapshots here. So in some sense, uh, we paved the way to the bio zone. I want to draw an analogy with, uh, I mean, probably it's too much of a uh, pretentious analogy with density functional theory. Density functional theory, I think is still superior in its own field than we are in our. Uh, but the idea is very similar. In density functional theory, you have a variational principle. And if you have a good guess for your functional, uh, you get an approximate, approximate calculation, but it can be accurate enough to pave and the way to explore new fields. And this has happened in condensed matter theory. Uh, similarly here, we need a variational principle, a good guess, and if you're lucky enough to combine the two, we have a new landscape to explore. So to give an example, this is a protein that folds in 15 minutes, which we simulated in all atom explicit solvent. This is a, one of the results of our simulations that explains how this protein eventually finds its own shape. And if you try to simulate this with a, uh, say, Chineka computer, you will need to start some 25 million years ago, in the simulation to see one event. But if you use uh, the special purpose supercomputers I was referring to, you could have started at the time of what Homus Neanderthalis in order to see one event. Okay, so clearly, this is to say, you need different approaches if you want to explore the biozone. And what we have done is some attempts, we were the first ones to say, to explore all of the biozones, but of course, we will not be the last ones and there will be people making better calculation than we are making, I'm sure. We just paved the way. But this, ex this slides explains, I think, uh, how much there is a need of additional technologies if you really want to be effective in biology from a physics-based perspective. So this was sort of the, uh, the first stop, the algorithmic stop. And the next stop was to do a systematic validation. Of course, I showed you comparison between simulations and simulations. But hey, we are physicists. We know that simulations against simulations is not good enough. In order to trust your calculation, you need to make comparison with experiments. And here comes the next challenge in biophysics. Most of the available experimental information in biophysics is either low resolution or extremely partial. Uh, and so many of, most of the time, what you end up doing is performing uh, qualitative versus qualitative comparison. Well, from the analysis of this experiment, I think this part of the protein should fold for last and this part should first fold first. And then you look at your simulations and you, oh, look, this part of the protein is acquiring its final configuration first and then the second comes. We are in agreement with the experiment. Yes, we are in agreement at the qualitative level. We are not in agreement in the sense that we have a data and a curve and the curve goes through the data. Now, there are exceptions. There are experiments where people can really measure things, but typically uh, one payoff uh, to do, one price to pay is that you have to alter the chemical composition of your chain in order to be able to resolve at high resolution, say some correlations between the atoms or distance and blah, blah, blah. For instance, you put uh, donor and, and acceptors of electronic excitations that modify the chemical structure of the protein. And then you don't really know whether what you're observing in the experiment has anything to do uh, with what goes on in the cell because you have a different molecule. Well, in some cases, I think you can trust it. In other cases, probably you don't. So we wanted uh, yeah, to explore the possibility of understanding dynamics for a system uh, without having to alter the chemical structure. And of course, the only way to do that is through photons because you can excite the protein and then record the emitted light. That doesn't involve any change of photons. So let me be uh, of chemical structure. Of course, there was sort of our angle into it. I'm not saying that whoever does differently doesn't bring contribution. Actually, a lot of has been gained by other methods. 
I just want to tell you what we've done because that's what my lecture is all about. Not to downgrade whatever was done with methods which compromise on other directions. Because physics in the end is the art of finding a good compromise, right? And, 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 and this is just an option we took for that. So let me tell you a little bit better. You have a protein that begins its folding, gets an intermediate configuration, absorbs the photon, goes into an excited state. These excites, they release the photon, move on, gets another configuration, absorbs another photon, and then the, you know, gets the excited. And then finally, through a sequence of conformational changes, reaches the native state. So if you, if you can send time resolved uh, information through sending photons at intermediate uh, in, in, in so at regular time basis and recording photon at intermediate you know at regular time basis then you can reconstruct the information about the folding process of course it's a very indirect reconstruction so you don't get the picture but from the physicist's point of view it's basically time resolved in elastic scattering of photons of proteins right and this is done by the chemists, by time resolve uh, decrease in circular decrease in experiments, for instance, time, time resolve spectroscopy. The problem is that to understand that from a the theoretical point of view, to be able to predict the cross sections as a function of time, literally, you need to solve a challenging problem, which is quantum problem now, because you are allowing electronic excitation. It's dynamical problem because you want time to be in the plane. And it's an open quantum system because your system is in contact with atomic nuclei that can change shape and an environment that can provide temperature. So this looks like an impossible challenge. And it took us five years to develop a quantum field theory to do that. Now, this looks like a, 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 almost a joke. Why should quantum field theory and relativistic quantum field theory be relevant for a problem like this? at all. And I want to give you, by this slide perhaps, an idea why we relied on a formalism that is normally used in relativistic field theory to solve for this problem. Uh, probably this is not the best slide. Let me just look for a better slide here. If I don't get it, I will go and look at it in a different, oh, there we go found it. So now we want to understand how electronic excitation come and go as a function of time as the sequence of photons showering into the proteins while the protein is folding. So from the theoretical perspective, what we want to do is to understand the evolution of the density matrix. There's no wave function in open systems. There's only density matrix. Now, remember, we want to do that in the path integral formalism because without path integral, we have the time separation problem, right? Now, if you want to do this in the path integral formalism, what you do, you do throttle decomposition on the time evolution, not of the wave function that would lead to the standard Feynman path integral, but of the density matrix. Now, in the density matrix, you have two evolution operator, one on the right and one on the left. So you have a forward time and a backward time, which brings all sorts of problems when you try to do path integral because you have part of your degrees, part of the dynamics that goes forward in time, but some of your degrees of freedom actually go on the lower part and they, they come from the other throttle of the composition and they go backward in time. So you have multiple time directions and this is really a mess. This is called the Keldish finger formalism and it's known to be very, very complicated. However, as nuclear physicists, we are not scared about having time flow in different directions because we know about antimatter. We know that antimatter is nothing but matter that flows backwards in time. So the idea, very simple idea, was simply to regard the lower part of the branch like the antimatter of the upper part of the branch. So in practice, what you do, you introduce fields because you need a relativistic formalism to have antimatter and you build scalar spinners doublets in which the upper components are the bigger components that go forward in time and the lower components are the lower uh, the small components of the spinner they go backward in time in magnitude they are the same of course so they, then you see how 
relativistic quantum field theory from nuclear physics gives you an angle to tackle a problem that in principle is, uh, is, 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 is very challenging. And you're basically trading the complications of relativistic quantum field theory in vacuum with the complications of non-relativistic open quantum systems. Now, there is additional approximation you exploit in this formalism, which uh, is the fact that the nuclei can be treated classically. And if you do things properly, you end up with a theory that looks, which has a path integral or a generating functional. Assume you, you, you're all familiar with the concept of uh, generating functional and path integral in gauge theories or in quantum field theory. And it looks surprisingly similar to a gauge theory. Like these psi and psi bar fields are for the upper and lower propagating fields. And the RQ fields are the conformational dynamics of the protein. And it plays the role of the gauge fields. And so basically what you do, you can translate your problem into a gauge physics problem. And then you can use the arsenal of techniques that are available in gauge theory. And we also developed some specific for the real time dynamics. And I will not go into the details of this, but as a result of which we could really put the experimental predictions and sorry, the theoretical prediction and the experimental measured quantity on the same plot and compare directly. And uh, this, I will not go into the detail uh, of these comparisons, but basically what we found was that we were able to predict uh, some properties that the key properties of the folding property foldings with an incredible degree of accuracy, much more than we had ever anticipated. So basically what we realized is that the folding goes like a train that stops in a few, maybe one or two fundamental stations. It's like if the train going from Verona to Rome that I was referring to before stops in Bologna and Florence and it spends time in Bologna and Florence, enough time to be able to record photons when the train is in, in Florence. Well, from these photons, you can reconstruct the structure, a signal that knows about the structure in those stations. And if you compare it, you discover that you have a, for your prediction to go as good as it actually does, you must be able to predict the structure within Armstrong accuracy, meaning you just perform a tiny, mostly invisible change in one of the side chains of your polymer and the signal changes completely. So we were much more accurate than we thought we were in predicting the folded intermediates. Yes, so basically we were in a condition to trust our simulation for the first time. And here we are talking about 2019, 18. Well, the results came before the paper. So that would say 2016. By the time we finalized the results and sent everything and get the paper accepted a few years passed, but we were starting to do that. So starting since 2017, 16, we began looking at, okay, we, we know we are reliable. Let's now pair up with molecular biologists and try to do real biology stuff and tackle biological relevant problems. And here you get a number of problems that we studied together, especially with a lab uh, led by Professor Biazzini a colleague in Trento in the biology, in the biotechnology department. And I will not tell you all of this, but, but what I want to finish my discussion with is by doing this, we realized something unexpected. We were the first one to look at the folding of large proteins, discovering and characterizing these intermediates. And when we had an idea, maybe we could use this knowledge to invent a new way to design drugs a new way for designing new therapeutic strategies. Exploit of this, uh, exploiting the new information that we could access, we could think of new ways of treating pathologies. Let's put it in the big scope way. So let me tell you how. Well, I told you before that most of biological functions are carried out by proteins, but proteins are also involved in the function you don't want to be uh, happening. For instance, you have a cancer, when you have a cancer, your cell is gone bananas and start duplicating, replicating, replicating DNA and you know, splitting into more and more cells in a way that is completely uncontrolled. And of course there are proteins that assist this process of cellular you know, uh, duplication. 
and you know transfer of genetic information and blah blah blah. If you want to stop this from happening, you have to inhibit those proteins. You have to make those proteins unable to perform their functions. And standard pharmacology basically works by inhibiting proteins, target proteins. In basically almost all the cases, it works on the protein native structure. So what? let me just remind you the fundamental dogma of biology. You have genetic information in the DNA. The genetic information goes in the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA goes into the ribosome, which is a 3D printer, reads the information, translates it into proteins. Proteins fold, reach the native structure. And then people look at this native structure they can resolve from experiment, and they look for pockets where they can stick molecules. And if the molecule sticks in a pocket, which is nearby where the protein is actually working, since if your protein was a scissor, you stick a molecule in the middle of the blades, the scissor cannot cut anymore. And so you inhibit the biological function. You might have heard of uh, very recent uh, developments, uh, even worth Nobel prizes in biology called gene editing that work on a completely different paradigm, much more upstream, try to change the genetic information and you know, perhaps changing, inhibiting the expression of a protein by knocking it out from the DNA. The idea we got was, of course, in the middle, since we could predict the protein folding intermediate. And the idea is, can we stop the protein folding process of our targets? Prevent proteins to reach the native state. So let me show this idea with a cartoon. We are able, through simulations, to reconstruct the network of transitions that a protein is able to do in order to reach the native state. And we characterize each of them structurally. Well, we can find drugs that bind to one of these states and by binding there prevents the reaction to move forward. The protein cannot close maybe or something like this. And the cell has a quality control machinery that looks around for proteins that are not properly folded and destroys them like, a, you know, garbage collectors and digestion. Basically the cell eliminates misfolded or partially folded protein. So by, by stopping proteins, we stimulate the cell to get rid of them. This idea was called a protein, it was, it was patented, and now INFN holds 50% of this patent, and it's called pharmacological protein inactivation by folded intermediate targeting, or PPI fit. And the idea is very simple. You get your protein, you, are, you simulate the folding transition, look for intermediates. Here you see this. This is an intermediate state. You structurally characterize intermediates. Then you look at the structure of your intermediates, look for pockets. Once you have a pocket, you look for databases. And in databases, you try to screen databases for small molecules that can bind to those intermediates. And you stop when you have a large affinity and you have enough steric constraints to prevent the rest of the folding to go. So in a paper that came up on uh, nature uh, communication biology this year, we have re finally released our first application of this idea that was based on trying to stop one of the uh, most deadly proteins that are known, that is the cellular prion protein, uh, which is involved in prion diseases. Now, the cellular prion protein is a perfectly healthy uh, protein you all have in your body. But in some patients, either because of genetic disorder or because they injected materials that contains misfolded proteins, this cellular prion protein can change shape and aggregate into misfolded uh, plaques that deposit on your brain and determine the death of the patient with 100% probability. So a way to, so this is considered undraggable. There's no pocket you can bind. There's nothing you can do with traditional pharmacology. Nobody was ever able to find a drug that could stop this process. And so in this paper, what we did, what we tried to use the PPI fit formalism to look for drugs that were able to reduce the expression of cellular prion protein in, in cells. And I will, not, for the sake of interest of time, I just going to tell you that, you know, this led to a second patent, again, with a significant participation of INFN in the intellectual property. 
And what you see here on the upper right corner is a, a percentage of uh, cellular prion protein as a function of concentration of the molecules we found by PPA fit in the cell. And as you can see, as we go on and put more of, of these molecules in the cell, the amount of proteins that are present in the cell goes down while other studies believe that there's little toxicity effect. And therefore you are able to modulate the expression of prion protein, cellular prion protein in the cell, as you would expect. This invention led to founding Sibilla, as was mentioned by Speranza at the beginning. Sibilla is a startup still, uh, although now he has about 10 employees. And so it's growing and it's preparing for a major step up, hopefully next year, uh, which carries on the research from the scientific to the industrial level. And here comes one discovery, and maybe I'm gonna stop for a moment in my lecture, it's almost done, I promise. By reasoning, by telling you something that was like an epiphany for me. So coming from science, I always divided the world in uh, the white horses, the good guys who do open science, open source and share information and the black horses, uh, the evil people who patent and keep secrets from themselves because they want to make money. And as you, you know, one of the, one of the uh, implications, one of the, one of the, what to say, evidences that you're growing older and, and is that you begin to discover gray tones and sometimes you discover that things are not as if thought. In particular, in order to start from an idea like this and develop a drug, you need probably some 20 million euros, roughly speaking, to complete the circle and test that you can really say it is working or it's not working. This is just the starting point of a journey. Who's gonna give you 20 million euros? Well, you have two options. You release the thing publicly. You hope that your national, the some national institution, maybe not yours, certainly not the Italian one, we have enough money to sponsor 20 million to pursue just this high risk I gain uh, way. Very likely this is not gonna happen, but if you don't patent it, no private, com no private investor will ever put a little even a euro on this because you will not put 20 million euros on the project that can be scooped by another one. So if you don't patent, your invention dies. Nobody's gonna use this and nobody's gonna find out whether you can find drugs and cure people with this technology or not, which I honestly don't know yet because you know, you get some initial results, but it's a very long, it's a 10 year long research to find out. But if you patent, that you get private investors that are ready to put on the table millions for you to find out because they know that very likely they fail, but if you, if, if you, if you succeed, they're gonna get tenfolds back, right? So patenting is a key to promoting industrial realization of scientific ideas without which you go nowhere. And as a scientist, we should begin understanding the importance of patenting much more than we actually uh, do when we uh, think in, within our, so to say, uh, cultural perimeter. Okay, this is the slides that includes the founders and, and the uh, people at Sibilla when this project that I'm gonna tell you started, uh, now Sibilla has grown. But the idea there was to apply the same uh, technology to try to look for an antiviral, uh, uh, an antiviral drug to fight COVID-19 infection. And now though, so you might have heard, everybody has heard about the fact that uh, COVID-19 infections uh, occurs by the interaction of a protein called spike, which is found on the surface of the virus and the protein called AC2, which is found on the membrane of our cells. And basically spikes bind to AC2 like an anchor and then exploits this to gate into the cell and spread the, the RNA into the cell. So uh, our idea was, can we use PPI fit to reduce the amount of AC2 proteins that we normally express so that spiky cannot penetrate the cell? But this time we have much less degree of freedom. We cannot look for a database of small molecules that are present that contain millions of them because going from that molecule to a drug will take 10 years of development. 
So what we look, we look for repurposing of drugs. The most famous, at least to me, uh, example of repurposing is Viagra, right? This was initially discovered as a hypertensive curing drug for people with some kind of hypertension in blood pressure. And later on, it was discovered that uh, its uh, artifacts, its side effects were potentially useful for people with uh, erectile dysfunctions. Now, the idea is very similar here. The idea is to look for drugs that have been already approved or are in the late stage of clinical trial and see if they can be repurposed to stop the expression of AC2. There are 9,000 of them, not millions. So what we did, again, INFN played a major role, paired up with Sibylla. It gave 15 million core hours power to simulate the folding of AC2. This is the one example of folding of AC2. It will take a couple of seconds. It's a long, long process. And at some time you will see the emergence of an intermediate state, Florence, as I told you in the analogy before. And then in the intermediate state, there we go. We look for pockets. And in the pocket, we scan the 9,000 possible compounds and find a few of them that are actually are predicted to bind. And then the next step is, of course, going into the lab and show that they inhibit the expression of AC2 in cells. So here's a bunch of them. We focus on this one, arthophenomel, which is the one that looked like more promising. You see, if I zoom, you see there is a decreasing the protein expression as a function of concentration in the first plot. And the second plot is the toxicity. At this concentration, none of the cells basically dies. And so you're thinking you're not stopping the expression because you're killing the cell. You're stopping the expression without killing the cell, which of course is important. And then once we have proven that this works in cell, we try to work on uh, viral infectors. Now I will skip the data on the pseudoviral, which is interesting, but I don't want to go too much long. And a couple, maybe a month and a half came the first results in conjunction with a team in the US where they tested this and they showed that indeed artefenol was reducing the, the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 infection in cells colonies in a dose dependent way. Now, as you can see, basically artefenol, what this data show you is on the X axis, the inhibition percentage, and uh, basically how fast the uh, duplication of uh, cell infected by RNA, by COVID-19 virus goes in, in cell colonies and the versus the concentration of our molecule. And as you can see, there is a nice correlation between them. Now, I will not go on in saying that this is, we have a cure for COVID, far from it, because there is an issue that the EC50, that is the concentration where the molecule reaches 50% efficiency is perhaps at the very, very, very end of the allowed dose. And therefore, perhaps you have to make uh, adjustments on the chemical structure of the chain to increase the efficiency and let it work before, which implies having to go through further clinical trial before you can approve this. So. Uh, I'm making no statements on the fact that we have a cure for COVID-19. I'm saying this protocol paved a way to start to do things. So I want to say this because uh, you can see how you can go from basically QC de Lagrangian to something that happens today in the, in the society through the sequence of events. That I okay, it has been a long journey. Uh, I'm almost done. I just want to spend two minutes telling about the future. What, where is this journey going in the next two years or three years? And I have two exciting directions. The most one is very recent and it's literally into space. Now, what is this all about? Now, this is still under review, but we are very, very optimistic that um, we uh, have a very large chance of being selected for a space mission on the ISS to be performed uh, to perform experiments able to resolve the structure of the cellular prion protein 
in the intermediate configurations bound to the molecule we have predicted. So now, what is this all about? So basically, remember, we have uh, by now a quite a significant amount of evidence showing that we can modulate the expression of cellular proteins in cells, in different cells. Some have been studied by Sibylla, others have been studied by, uh, by academia. They're all cell-based assays. They are biochemical assays. What we still miss is the ultimate so the circadian experiment in which we are able to resolve the structure of the protein bound in an intermediate state to the molecule we have predicted in the place we have predicted. We all agree this would be the smoking gun. However, this experiment is impossible to be performed on Earth because when protein gets stuck in intermediate states, they expose hydrophobic regions. And when two proteins have hydrophobic regions, they try to eliminate water and they attract each other, leading to the formation of aggregates that precipitate. And with this precipitate, you can do nothing. However, it is well known that in space, due to microgravity conditions, actually not really microgravity, micro G, because in the International Space Station, gravity is 95% more or less, right? Of what it is on Earth, but you're in free fall. So in micro G conditions, uh, you don't have participation, obviously, and you don't have convective motions that typically are enhancing the rate of aggregation. So we have submitted a proposal together with a private company called Space Pharma that developed the technology to perform crystallization experiment in space. And we are quite confident that uh, an Israeli mission to be launched by operated by SpaceX in, 2000, in January 2022 called the Axiom 1 space mission, you can find that on Wikipedia, will include among its four scientific experiments, one experiment to perform the uh, protein reconstruction. Uh, this will be announced in two weeks. Uh, the, the evaluation committee is finishing. Uh, we are confident. If not, it will be the next one because the Israeli uh, um, side is very enthusiastic about doing this uh, in the ISS quite soon. So this is one direction for the future. We provisorily call this mission the Zephyr mission, uh, zero uh, gravity uh, folding intermediate reconstruction, but this is a preliminary name we just gave discussing among us. Uh, we will officially release the formal name, mission name once it has been approved. Uh, uh, another interesting directions that I'm exploring with my group is how to improve on simulation for the next generation. And we are doing that by trying to combine artificial intelligence and quantum computing, we just released the physical review letters in which we show how to combine this technology with a instant on formalism to predict protein folding pathways. And a more fundamental question is, we have discovered there are intermediates, are there by chance or nature has evolved in order to make them, in order to perform some biological functions and this is a direction we want to go because if you can find an answer, yes, it means that there is a layer in the unexpected layer in the fundamental dogma of biology where evolution is acted. I should say we did not discover folding intermediates, but we were the first ones to see that they systematically occur in every single uh, eukaryote proteins we looked and be able to characterize them in atomistic detail using simulations. And uh, so if you can answer this question, this would be very exciting because a new territory opens up. What is the biology of folding intermediates? Okay, there are many people I want to thank in this lecture. The people at Sibylla who stopped their, uh, you know, startups have limited uh, freedom of operation before they die out. 90% of startups die out within the first five years. Yet they stopped their business plan to develop a pro-COVID, anti-COVID uh, research known for profit, and I think they have to be um, sort of uh, given credit for that. Uh, all the information about the virus and, and the drug were publicly released, given the emergency. Of course, I have a large number of collaborators over these 15 years, I cannot give any uh, of them enough credit. But I want to I wanna close my lecture by saying, hey, nuclear physics is a fantastic, fantastic um, playground to develop techniques to study complex systems. So 
we should really think in terms of using this specific uh, advantage of nuclear physics to think of nuclear physics not only as a fundamental science, which of course it is, but also as perhaps the most promising tool to develop interdisciplinary research and promote this view, I think will be good for both nuclear physics and other disciplines. And I think I could not stop in any other sentence than this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pietro. Very nice and exciting. So now we have one extra reason to ask to travel on the space station. <laughs> so let's see whether there are questions from the young generation. Uh, hello, I had a small question. Please. Good morning. Uh, morning. Uh, Thanks a lot for the talk. Really interesting. Bordering somewhere between science and science fiction, to be honest, in that sense. Uh, It's really amazing. Uh, Actually, my question was a little more general in the sense that uh, what would you say is the major, I I don't know, maybe competition or something else to at least the application part of your speed? Because I think that there are also uh, enterprises like Folding at Home, etc., which are basically using uh, computation resources spread out over different computers. Uh, like, you know, spread out science to do the same thing. So would you say that they are more competitive in the same sense, or is that research more or less complementary to yours? Well, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for bringing this up. Remember, at some point I was mentioning uh, the zoology of alternative methods, right? I think it's one of the slides. And, um, for, for, the, for the interest of the rest of the audience, uh, folding a tome is a brilliant idea uh, that was developed in Stanford, mostly in the group of uh, Vijay Pande. And the idea is that, you know, instead of building one supercomputer to perform long simulations, uh, why don't we run, uh, we take advantage of the fact that people don't use their computer for most of the day. Think about all the offices that have computers on idle for three quarters of the day. And, you know, people could sign up voluntarily, can still, and if they do, when the computer goes on idle, it goes on the server, downloads a bit of molecular dynamics that simulates that, and maybe does a one nanosecond of dynamics and returns the results. But the idea is that you have millions and millions of such computers spread over the globe. So you have a, all of a sudden enormous of a, a capability. That's a fantastic idea. Of course, simulating millions of very short events is not the same thing as simulating one million times long event. Right? So for this reason, they need a technology to recollect all of this data into something that is statistically mean, feel meaningful, that is called Markov state modeling, which I will not go into the details. So this is a fantastic, extremely promising idea, which up to very minor, very minor uh, concepts and, and limitations, which not even worthwhile mentioning at this level, is basically as accurate as MD, at least in the low resolution a level of uh, uh, time resolution you're really interested in. Uh, the problem is that by doing Markov state models, people could not fold a protein of 300 amino acids uh, folding in, say, 20 seconds. A typical protein that sits in the middle of the biosome. They could go and cover up the Anton simulation, and maybe they would be able to go a little bit further than that in the next decade or so. So there is room for interest in biophysics in a lot of processes. But as far as folding is concerned, the contribution of folding at home was mostly into showing that indeed models are accurate enough to fold the mini proteins. But going to a protein as large as a typical protein, well, this is probably on the largest side, but I think no way folding at home could ever fold this because this folds in minutes, 15 minutes actually. Okay, so, so are we better than folding a tone? No, because folding a tone does no additional, uh, introduces no additional approximation other than the Markovian description of the step, but, but no reaction coordinate, no variation, doesn't need a native state. On the other hand, we do need information about the native structure. We need to guess a reaction coordinate. And if the guess is very wrong, our results are very wrong. And therefore we never quite know whether we are completely accurate. You know, think about this as a variation of Monte Carlo calculation, sort of. So we are complementary in most respect. 
And like, again, the, the parallelism I wanted to draw was with density functional theory. There are regions where density functional theory works and then you can do a lot of stuff. But there are regions where density functional theory is very inaccurate and there you're back to more expensive methods and there's nothing you can do. And what right. I answer? Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. That was really insightful, thanks. It just connected to this question. I was curious about alpha fold. Oh, that's another recurrent question. So now for the, for the sake of the rest of the audience, AlphaFold has been uh, famously uh, reaching the media because for the first time, uh, an artificial intelligence driven algorithm was able to predict the sequence structure relationship with a very, very, very large accuracy. So what is the sequence structure relationship? If we go back to this slide, remember some very specific sequences of amino acids determine a very funnel energy scape. So the, the structure of the protein, the, the information about what is the structure of the protein is encoded in the sequence of amino acids of the chain. So reconstructing the structure given the sequence is called part one of the protein folding problem. Part two being reconstructing the folding pathway. That's what we deal with. We deal with say nothing about power. Now alpha fold was apparently very, very performing into the term in in determining the native structure given the sequence. In some sense, they are completely complementary to what we do because we take the native structure as an input and reconstruct the folding pathway. I want to play the devil advocate and cool down a little bit the enthusiasm on alpha fold. Alpha fold. Uh, so in principle, if alpha fold was an established tool, tool that was working for any protein, people could instead of reconstructing the experimental structure of native structure, use this code, saving, say, about 200,000 euro per protein, okay? Because folding, uh, reconstructing the structure of a protein costs about 200,000 euros, maybe a little more, a little less. However, there are proteins for which this cannot be done. So for instance, membrane proteins or class of proteins, which are very hard to crystallize. Now, one could say, fantastic, I use alpha fold for those because I cannot do experiment on those, right? And this cannot be done because alpha fold is based on a neural network. The neural network was trained on proteins that were crystallized. So alpha fold is able to recognize only the native structure of proteins who belong to the class of proteins that can be crystallized. So you cannot use it it's, you know, to perform predictions of proteins that, for which there was no training sample. And the second limitation is that if you're a pharma, uh, so for academic research though, you might wanna save 200 euros and use alpha fold if, rather than having to crystallize your protein. That's a great step forward. But for, 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 for industrial and pharmaceutical research it's completely relevant because 200 euros for a pharma that is ready to invest 10 million euros will be an easy spend if you're sure that your experimental structure is, is, is more robust than a theoretical prediction. There is a, on top of that, a, a strong bias against purely theoretical predictions in biology and pharmacology. And we might open a discussion and digression about why is that maybe another time. Uh, but certainly pharma will trust experimental reconstruction far more and 200,000 euros is really nothing that can change the budget in any directions. But as far as us is concerned, yes, it is relevant because we don't have 200,000 euros. And we might be interested in starting a process that involves a native state for which there is no crystal structure, but it could be possible to determine it. Let's use alpha fold, get the crystal structure and do the folding pathways. Um, may, may I ask you a short Ciao, question? Ciao. Um, the quantum annealing could in future play some role in uh, speeding up uh, the whole uh, procedure, I would say. Oh, so this is a fantastic question. We just published a physical review letters in which we show, we show how um, quantum annealing can be used to compute protein folding pathway. That's the physical review letters that came up this year, actually. It was accepted in December. So yes, uh, this is a field where we are very active now. I, I would say uh, it's the field where my 
personal activity is the largest because of course I have very little to say about uh, biochemical procedure in space, right? Other than probably coordinating the initiative in terms of big picture, I'm not a crystallographer, so, you know. Uh, but but my, my attention is very much into combining AI and quantum computing. And in a nutshell, the idea is to, uh, first of all, the calculation of protein folding pathways in our formalism can be phrased as a variational problem, which is an optimization problem. And and, and quantum computing and quantum annealing are good for optimization problems. And in fact, in this, in this first paper, we showed how to exploit this. And, the, and we also opened the way to help with artificial intelligence to do this in a more efficient way. If you want, I can give you details, but going to the next level of details will take me 10 minutes. Thanks, that's enough. <laughs> Maybe I would like to ask you another thing about your startup. Sure. Uh, namely, that, I mean, you describe it, I think, it quite well. But I'm curious about the interaction now that you may have. You explained the value of patents, that's clear. But also now, say, how you see, because you, you talked about the need to have, say, a somewhat substantial amount of money, say, from some source, yeah. no? private yeah. investors. Say. How, how realistic you find it is for a group like yours? I think now, I mean, this is a, a question that is, of course, of broader interest. No? So I'm not sure there many people who would like maybe to start startups. But this, because now I'm, I'm finishing, but there is also a point, I think, that uh, when you go to this um, biology, say, environment, there is a point I think is important for a physicist because we are used to some way uh, to, to deal with something that rather, uh, how to say, if not easy, but is essential that uh, an experiment can be repeated in a very, say, in, in a very controlled way. I think that when a physicist is exposed to this biological environment, one finds one finds that is confronted with this hard reality in a sense that all experiments are somewhat difficult to repeat. There is, there is a, a, big, a big jump going, I think, from the simulation that find one can do on a computer and making a real drug. So how, how you see this? Okay. This is, uh, for me, very intriguing. Okay, right? you, really, you, you, you raised two different questions and they're both very important. And, and if you allow me, I would like to answer to both. So, uh, but, but there are two different questions. One yes. thing is, uh, so the, the, let me first start with the first one. How hard it is to found a startup and to say get investments and proceed along the investment. And here comes the first big surprise. We're used in science to the concept that money is never available not even if you have a good idea, right? I mean, the, it's, it's very difficult to have money for, for pursuing an interesting idea when it's very early stage. Now, the big surprise I got is that the problem with investing in startups is not the lack of money at all. Even in Italy, it is the lack of good ideas. If you have a good idea, you will find investment. If the idea, has value proposition and market. What does it mean? Of course, you have an idea for something that has no market. You can be as good as you want, but it's not gonna get any money, right? You, know, you have a fantastic way of doing something people don't need. There's no market for it. Value proposition means I have something that is needed and that has a market and I have a way to solve it. In this case, I can find drug candidates. If you have these two things, you have an original idea for this, in this time, finding investments is really not an issue. Money is not a problem. We could choose between many investments and we, we were perhaps on the upper side of the distribution in Italy, to be honest, but we, I'm pretty confident speaking with investors, speaking with people in the business that the situation would not be radically different. In particular, if you're working with information technology and biotechnologies these days, there is room. What is lacking is original ideas. So go up there and try. 
and, and take a course on intellectual property, take a course on venture capital and start up. This is something, and don't be afraid to fail. That's the other thing. In Italy, we consider failing a startup as a failure in our life. There are some places in the United States, they don't hire you if you haven't failed a startup <laughs> because they consider failing a startup something physiological that teaches a, a good deal. So you see, first of all, we need to change perspective. We need to understand that uh, there is a need of ideas. This is the time to come up with ideas and you have to be bold and ready to fail. That's the first thing I want. There is a second question that touches very, maybe marginally what you say, but I want to bring up. What is the role of the scientists after they have founded a startup? And this is another surprise I got. You have to let your startup go. You cannot be part of academia and startup actively at the same time. In my original mind, I was thinking about this highly integrated way of progressing with the startup and, and the academia together. Uh, the legislation is, is such that you cannot be play any uh, active role in the startup. You can be a consultant, fine. But even if you accept that, which of course you have as an academic, uh, there's always going to be problem for if you work in the gray line between fundamental research and your own research in the startup uh, that you're operating, because you're gonna be always asking yourself, am I in a conflict of interest? I'm in damaging my institution or my startup if I do research on this. And that. Give an example, I was invited to collaborate with an important team in San Francisco, and they wanted to show me some confidential information about the protein they had. And I decided to stop the train and say, I'm an academic, I would participate as an academic, but I'm a member of a startup that does pharmaceutical research. If they start working on that protein, I'm gonna be sued because I released insider information. So before we go move any step forward, we have the lawyers involved and decide what I can know, what I cannot know. And after a while you get tired of all this and you decide to sort of choose which side you wanna be. I chose to be a scientific, you know, an academic. And if I want to work for Sibilla, I will take a year off, work one year for Sibilla full time, and then go back as an academic full time, doing the two things together. Now, Sibilla has a research collaborative agreement with INFN on fundamental research. But this has a list of topics that is decided beforehand for a limited amount of time. And there I can work with Sibilla on this problem, this problem, this problem, and we agree before we start. But it's, you know, it's more exception than the rule. And that's my answer. Sorry. So if I can add up a question. So is there a, a kind of memorandum of understanding between Sibylla and the INFN? There is a written agreement, a, a material transfer agreement that oh. regulates all of the details. Okay. Who's gonna get the intellectual property? who is going to be informed, what are the problems that fall into this category. Yes. And, you know, everything is right. And it has to be that way. Because yes. otherwise, you, you know, you, we're all friends before things happen. Yes, but Probably is there, is there a, a timing fixed? Yes, there is a timing, there is an end of the collaboration, then you, you may renew it. At the moment, the collaboration ends, I think, in a year from now, or shortly okay. less than that. And that we'll see. I mean, what Sibylla wants to do. And I'm not part of the, you know, now Sibylla has an international CEO from Spain, an international board of directors. And I have a, I'm only a scientific advisor. When they want my opinion, they call me and I give my opinion about science. So I, have, I'm, I will not be involved into the further development of Sibylla. But when I was in, in, in Stanford, for this Italian innovation, uh, USA Innovation Forum, I spoke with the Dean of Stanford University. You might know Stanford University is the top of the world for innovation. Yeah, they are in Silicon Valley, <laughs> of course. You know. And they, they also at the front edge of the legislation for regulating the fact that all of their professors have a startup, right? And I was discussing with her and I, I was pleased to find out that this is the model to work. You know. You set up agreement on what you can do research together and you do it on a short time basis on very limited projects. And then you wanna do something that is unrelated to those projects, take your year off, convince your academia, you want a sabbatical, 
or you take a year leave or whatever, and then you do things on the other side if it's industrial property, uh, but, but work on, on clean basis. This is very important. Comment, if I may, to the second question that was raised before, which you think is very important. There is an enormous leap in going from physics to biology, which comes both ways. So the real sad and exciting things at the same time of biology is that you never control all the variables of your system. You know, you never have a, you're never in a situation that if you see a spike in a cross section, that's a Higgs boson, period. You never are. There is always an alternative explanation for what you see, which will not involve the wanna be the equivalent of a Higgs boson. Because cell in a cell, everything happens with different probability, but everything happens and everything can happen. And the number of degrees of freedom is huge. So physicists took a long time before they understood that and they made overstatements and they lost the trust of the biologists who consider physicists uh, for a long time, they consider the physicists uh, first of all, very arrogant. Second, uh, th they think they can understand something, but they only grasp, uh, and they can reduce a protein to a chain of little balls, but the protein is in an environment where everything may happen. And so they don't grasp the right size. And to be honest with you, they're right. But things are changing. Things are changing the last five years, and two in particular, because physicists, this is just an example. There are many examples like this in the community, were able to understand the lesson, develop better techniques, and start working with the biologists on the questions that the biologists have. So in my own experience, the largest part, the lag time, if you look, for instance, the citation rate is like grows, flats, and then very recently grows again. That lag time was needed to understand a language, to speak with people, understand what questions they really need. What is the what and, and, and what I came out with is that in the end, as physicists, what we can do is to be very efficient hypothesis builder. So in other words, in a biological environment, the same observation can be due to potentially any possible explanation. What physicists can do can say, look, here is a bunch of physics-based <laughs> scenarios. Go on and test them. But these are at least physics-based. You restrict the possible scenarios from infinity, to five. And then in these five scenarios, you can get so little insight so they can get an edge on testing those more specifically. And by doing this, slowly agglomerating towards um, a step forward in the knowledge. So it's a longer process, but it's still Galilean loop. It just involves biology and takes a longer circle. And you're part of a larger ingredient, a machine than just doing things in your lab or within the physicist community. Okay, fine. So we are close to the set time to, to finish. Is there any other question? Maybe Angela uh, Speranza speaking. Uh, yes. I, just to say a few words, I would like to thank uh, Pietro very much for this uh, beautiful and inspiring uh, seminar. Thank you, Pietro. Uh, thank it has you been much. really appreciated. And I want also to thank uh, all of you for attending the, the event. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, we thank you for proposing such an exciting two hour uh, walk around. So if uh, there is uh, no more question or discussion, I stop the recording. I thank you all. And thank you also to Stefania that we are seeing now. Yes. And see you this afternoon then. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Good Thank luck you, for Pietro. the continuation. Thank you a lot. Good luck. Bye. Thank you, Pietro. Thanks. Bye. Ciao, bye -bye. Pietro. Grazie. Ciao, ciao. ciao.